Hi, welcome to Forever Paranormal with Dr. Bill and Deb. The term paranormal refers to phenomena and experiences that are beyond the scope of normal scientific understanding and cannot be easily explained through traditional scientific principles. These phenomena often challenge conventional beliefs and are associated with the supernatural, metaphysical, or unexplained aspects of reality. As with any field of inquiry, it is essential to approach the paranormal with an open but critical mind, relying on empirical evidence and logical reasoning to draw conclusions. It's a topic that continues to intrigue and challenge both believers and skeptics alike, and if we can connect a paranormal element to it, we'll talk about it. You'll be surprised by what all can be connected to the paranormal. Please don't forget to follow, rate, and share the show, since it would not be possible without you, our listeners. And as a public service, we would like to let everyone know that you are truly never alone, even if you think you are. The Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is 988. Please just reach out. Well, hello there and welcome. This week we are going to discuss a pretty bizarre death, that of Christopher Case, the man purportedly killed by a witch's curse. Hi there, Deb. You're looking pretty sunshiny this week. Hi. What does sunshiny work look like? Uh, nice, happy, pretty, you know, those okay. kind of things. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. You know, it's hard to believe that we are at the end of July already. Yeah. Yeah. Stinks. August starts tomorrow, and soon the weather will be making that swing to cooler days. And what does this all mean? Mm-hmm. We're getting that much closer to Halloween. Oh, boy. Here we go. Yeah, I know that's probably a downer for you, but hey, you know. <laughs> as long as you're happy. <laughs> yeah. So, were you able to find us anything interesting this week? Well, yeah. Um, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. I have a hypothetical question for discussion. Okay. If you had to prove you were human and not AI, in a text conversation, how would you do it? Well, that's a really good hypothetical question, let me tell you. But I have a question for you before Mm -hmm. I can answer the question. Okay. Do I know the person that's texted me, or do I know the number that's texted me, or do I not know the person or not know the number? Well, let's say... Let's say that you receive a text from an, a new phone number you don't recognize, but it says, this is so-and-so, a name you do recognize, okay. and this is my new phone number. So y- you reply, and, and how do you determine if that is really the person that you they say they are? Okay. Well, <clears throat> I think one of the first things that I would do, I would say, oh, okay, Thanks for sending me the number. How is your wife so-and-so and and use a wrong name? I would ask them a personal question that only that person may know to verify that it's them. That's one of the things I would do. Mm -hmm. So now the person that has to provide the proof has to prove they're not AI. So I'm thinking if this person is really who they are, they would have to say something you would know, like, well, what do you mean? My wife is... Exactly. They'd have to respond with, no, my wife's so-and-so. Maybe you got me confused. Mm -hmm. Something like that. That's good. I I was thinking more along the lines of my response would be some sort of shorthand language that, like, you know, let's say I just wanted to be a smartass and say, F you. AI is not going to come up with that response. No, but, you know, you don't want to offend the person either. Well, I mean, it, it may be a business contact. It may be a distant well, yeah, relative yeah, or yeah. something. It I, depends you don't on want what... To, you don't want to offend anybody. It depends on the person they say they are, of course, but it'd be an answer that you 
wouldn't expect from a computer. Uh-huh. Like some, or, you know, replacing letters with symbols or something like that. I think AI would pick up on that, but... I don't know. Anyhow, okay. There are many reports and studies on how to detect AI, but not many regarding this particular conundrum. If I had to guess the old CAPTCHA verification method, you know, where you have to select the pictures that or have... Or check a box or something, yeah. ...something to prove you're not a robot, um, before too long, that's probably going to be obsolete. We're going to have to do more than multi-factor verification for just about everything. What I read about the detection of AI usage is that you have to look at the inconsistencies in how sentences are formed and how impersonal the response may be. May You know, like they don't use names, they don't use he, she, they, whatever. Mm-hmm. One survey that I found posed a similar question asking what one word participants could use to distinguish themselves from an AI response. Okay. And the most popular and likely to be successful response was poop. Poop, really? Poop. Huh. So my take on this is society is going to have to either learn to curse like a sail- sailor or get on board with the text acronyms in vernacular of the younger generation. What do you think? Well, yeah, but I think the more that people like use poop or something like that, it's going to learn. It's going to learn. Yeah. AI is constantly learning. So it would be a constant change. Well, I guess that's a bridge we'd have to cross. When right. That that, that's something we'd have to go across when we got there because AI continually learns. Yeah. It learns from every single thing it does. I don't know the end all be all answer, but for now, uh, let's just go with F you or don't answer at all. <laughs> yeah, well, that'd be a good one, you know. And if they get offended, that, that might be a better mm-hmm. one than mine. Because if yeah. they do get offended, you can say, well, I know you're not a robot, <laughs> right? A robot's not going to get offended. So you may have a better way to go about it than me, Deb. Maybe, That's I pretty cool, pretty cool. All right, thanks for that. Mm-hmm. That got me thinking, let me tell you. Okay, Deb. We've talked about cursed and hunted objects in episodes 19 and 25, and there were some pretty wild tales in those episodes, but here is a curse of a different kind. This is about a man who was targeted and cursed by a witch. Yeah, and the guy died within a week of being cursed. There is not a ton of information out there about this tale, but there are multiple newspaper reports and and police report and one of them include interviews with some of his friends that he was consulting with about this curse. We, of course, are talking about the infamous tale of Christopher Robert Case, the man who was killed by a witch's curse in April of 1991. All right, for a little background, Christopher was born in Richmond, Virginia on August 8, 1955, And at one point, he had moved to Raleigh, North Carolina, where he worked in the music industry. It's not clear whether he was a DJ, a a producer, or what, just, just that he worked in the industry. We know from the June 1989 issue of Spin Magazine that it was announced that Christopher was hired away from a rival company to become the director of programming for Muzak two years prior So that would be sometime around 1987. In case you're wondering what in the world music is, it is the background music that is commonly played in commercial spaces like retail stores, restaurants, and elevators. And originally, music referred to a specific company founded in the 1930s that provided these background music services. After the company folded in 2012, though the term kind of became synonymous with any and all background or elevator type of music. Okay, anyhow, back to the story. Enough about elevator music. (laughs) According to all accounts, Christopher made a lot of new friends in Seattle, but he never lost touch with his old ones. He was a single guy for a long time, as he was used to traveling a lot because of his work and lived alone. He was a fitness nut, used to take it and used to take his vitamins and stuff every day regularly and he didn't have any serious health issues and he used to exercise pretty regularly as well 
One particular area of interest for Case was the music of ancient cultures. His curiosity and passion for these historical sounds were so profound that he often that they kind of often became the focus of his conversations and his studies. So this all kind of started around April 11, 1991, when Christopher Case went to San Francisco on a business trip. Some sources say that during the trip, a mutual friend had put him in contact with a woman 10 or 20 years his senior, depending on the source, that said she was an expert on ancient Egyptian music. The name of the woman he met to this day still remains undisclosed. The police reports don't even mention her name anywhere. And then, as the meeting unfolded, the woman, in a really weird sudden turn of events, expressed romantic interest towards Case. However, working to maintain his professionalism and respect, Case gracefully declined her advances. The woman was seemingly enraged by his rejection and began ranting and screaming. She declared herself to be a witch and proceeded to put a curse on Christopher, vowing that he would deeply regret his decision to reject her and that he would be dead within a week. Christopher didn't take this seriously at all, as he didn't believe in any supernatural things. He just kind of went back to his home in Seattle, and the next morning forgot all about the incident. On April 14th, Case called his friend Sammy Sounder, and another unnamed friend in Fayetteville, North Carolina, and told her he wasn't able to sleep at night because he was hearing strange whispers and footsteps, he told her he felt like someone was watching him because he was seeing shadows moving around his apartment. She supposedly advised him at this point to go get help. I mean, yeah, why tell someone across the country? Why not go get local help? Well, some of the background I found out about Sammy was she was supposedly a psychic type of somewhat medium and into the esoteric and the metaphysical. So he called her because he thought she might be able to give him some help. And I think she did tell him to go get local help, you know. But we'll, I think we'll find that out here as we go. But he, I thought he didn't believe in any of that. He didn't until this started happening and he talked to her. I see. Right? When things start happening, your beliefs start to change. Right? So, anyhow, let's move on. Because then on the morning of April 16th, he again called Sammy to tell her how he got attacked last night. When he was sleeping, he told her that someone was trying to suffocate him by unseen hands. And when he woke up in the morning, he also noticed some cuts on his fingers and blood stains around his bed sheets. I guess at this point you start to believe in something, right? Maybe. Yeah. That morning, he went to a religious bookstore and picked up a handful of crucifixes. And after being asked by the store manager what in the world he needed all those for, he told him that he was being attacked by some supernatural powers. Purportedly, the store manager handed him some other religious books and a few rosaries and some books on witchcraft and stuff and said that would help him. And then on the afternoon of the 16th, he placed the crucifixes all around his home with candles and poured salt on all the entries and also wrote notes on how to overcome supernatural powers that were scattered all over the place. I think from one of the reports I read, he poured salt around the whole perimeter of the apartment. Everything was, was in heavy in salt. And even after that, on the evening of the 16th, something strange happened, which is not clear, but he was so frightened that he left his home to stay in a hotel that night. Sammy, being unable to contact Christopher that night, called the local Seattle police to do a welfare checkup on him. Police found the residence locked and were unable to gain access. So they reported back to the station and they just went on about their business. Wait, so if doing a welfare check, why did they just leave? Why didn't they try to gain access? I think they looked around, saw nothing suspicious, no smell, no this, no that, no noise coming, so they just left. Kind of like when we had a neighbor one time that was very old, and they did some welfare checks on her a few times when she wasn't there. Mm -hmm. You remember, they just kind of looked around the house, didn't check things, and just left. I mean, they didn't go in the house or anything. Are they not allowed to? I, I have no idea. I don't, know, I don't know anything about that, and I don't want to know anything about the cops. 
Okay. So, all right. Then, on the morning of the 17th, Sammy received a message on her answering machine from Christopher stating that he had come dangerously close to being caught and that this was his final day on earth. This news wasn't just heard by Sammy, but also by a Catholic priest and the religious bookstore manager. That seems pretty wild. So he called three people? No, I guess he talked to those people. Uh-huh. He, he called her, left a voicemail. He again talked to the a priest, and he again talked to the store manager. Okay. Thought this would be his last day. Okay. Okay. Then on the 18th, Sammy called the police again for another welfare check. And upon arriving, this time they found the door unlocked. So therefore, I think they were allowed to go in, right? So here's what was originally reported in the Seattle Times. Prompted by information from a Fayetteville, North Carolina woman who told police the man felt his life was in jeopardy after a woman had put a curse on him, King County Police found the body of Christopher Case, 35, in an empty bathtub lined by completely burnt down candles in his apartment in the 1300 block of North 152nd Street, shortly after 4 p.m. Thursday. There was no evidence of foul play, but the presence of several crucifixes and piles of kosher salt throughout the apartment have baffled investigators. King County Police Major Jackson Beard said the salt, candles, and other objects found at the scene have some significance in self-protection against demons or evil forces. In this apartment there was a book called Strange Customs that explains that the salt is a devil repellent. Well, apparently, the police found lines of salt poured along the base of the walls throughout the apartment with piles at the corners. The same thing was done on the porch where the salt was poured in a geometric design and crucifixes were hung on all the walls. I'm assuming the geomet- uh, geometric design was a pentagram of some sort, but it doesn't really say that. That's just my assumption. And the police officer goes on to say, it's pretty clear he thought something was going on, said Beard of the deceased man. However, Beard said the crime scene doesn't suggest that someone came in and did something to him. Beard then went on to say that the police will know more when tests are done to determine if there was any toxic substances in his bloodstream, and that will take at least two weeks. At this point, this is a very suspicious death, something that needs to be explained, said Beard, who is commander of the King County Police North Precinct. I don't believe there was any foul play. Obviously, though, I'd like to know what the toxicology report says. This could be a suicide, a natural death, or there could be something else going on here. There's also some evidence that Case was seeking psychic help to ward off the curse. I guess that's by the books and stuff. Then in May of 1991, Seattle Times did a follow-up on the story and went on to say the death of Christopher Case, 35, had drawn wide interest because he had told friends he feared he was under a witch's curse. The cause of death was acute myocarditis, said Richard Garner, a medical investigator with the King County Medical Examiner's Office. You know, shockingly, within a week of his encounter with his self-proclaimed witch, Christopher Case's life was tragically cut short. The circumstances surrounding his untimely death remain a mystery and add an eerie layer to the woman's chilling curse, actually. You know, it's pretty wild. Ultimately, the coroner diagnosed acute myocarditis as the cause of death. For those who might suggest that he scared himself to death due to some advanced psychological distress, that would be an extremely rare and unprecedented occurrence in a young, healthy man with no pre-existing conditions. As the King County Medical Examiner and the Seattle Police are really not into the business of paranormal research, it seems like heart failure was a satisfying enough explanation for the death of Christopher Case, and the investigation just ended there. So, to me, it sounds like possibly there was some health issue that was undiagnosed, untreated, until his death even though by all appearances, he was in top shape. 
yeah, that's possible, you know, but let's take a little trip down a rabbit hole here. Okay. Let's look what exactly is myocarditis, because I looked this up, and it's a condition characterized by inflammation of the heart muscle and is frequently triggered by viral infections, such as those associated with the common cold or the flu. This occurs when the virus directly infects the heart muscle, leading to inflammation. So yes, he could have had something undiagnosed, but there's other things about this. In addition to viral infections, myocarditis can also be instigated by an autoimmune response. And in these cases, the body's immune system mistakenly identifies the heart muscle as a foreign entity and attacks it, resulting in the inflammation. Other potential causes of myocarditis include bacterial infections, which can directly invade the heart muscle in a parasitic infection, which can also lead to inflammation. Certain medications, particularly those that can weaken the heart or immune system, may also contribute to the development of myocarditis. Yes, so he could have got something within that week that was undiagnosed, clearly. But most people with myocarditis recover without any complications. But in rare cases, the inflammation can be severe and cause damage to the heart. Treatment typically involves rest, medication, to reduce the inflammation and relieve the symptoms, and in some cases, hospitalization. Okay, we know he wasn't sick with any pre-existing health conditions unless he got something that weak. He worked out on a regular basis and was a health nut. If you believe all the social media crap about myocarditis, you would think it was a it has a very high mortality rate. But according to experts in the cardiac field, inflammation of the heart muscle caused by myocarditis is a mild temporary condition in the vast majority of cases. According to experts, irreversible scarring may occur rarely in severe cases, but even then it may be possible for the heart muscle to heal with treatment. Experts say claims that patients with myocarditis have a high mortality rate are incorrect and misinterpret the scientific literature on the condition. Okay, now we know that his death is due to myocarditis according to the autopsy. And I guess it is possible, but it's really not plausible when you look at the facts surrounding not only his health, but also his healthy lifestyle. Okay, now let's take a look at the witch. Did she do it? Maybe, maybe not. Was it simply a curse like something out of the Stephen King novel Thinner? Or something way more complex? In my thoughts, if it was the witch, then there is more to it than just a curse that you will die within a week. There are many ways to slip a potion into someone's drink, whether it be tea, coffee, water, or soda. And there's some herbs out there to use for the basis of such potions that come to mind to me like belladonna, monkshood, or maybe foxglove, just to name a few. If I had to pick one, it would be foxglove, because we know this herb is used heavily by the pharmaceutical companies and medicines to treat certain heart conditions, and it's not traceable in any typical tox screen. So that would be a good one to use. I mean, what do you think, Deb? Curse? Natural causes? A potion or just plain bad luck? I think I'm going to go with natural causes here. Okay. It all seems strange to me, given that he chose to tell someone across the country and some random dude in a bookstore, but did not seek help or guidance from someone locally. And since the case is obviously closed, why is the name of said witch still undisclosed? I mean, I would think someone would want to hear her side of the story, right? This is very weird to me. I just have to pick the logical conclusion on this one. Yeah, well, I guess maybe the reason her name is still undisclosed was mm -hmm. she's entitled to her privacy. The police didn't think there was anything to the curse and she was involved in anything, so why would her name need to come out? On that aspect, she's entitled to her privacy. But but I want to look at another thought here, okay? We, we talk a lot about universal consciousness and energy and like a Reiki master, right? They can take positive healing energy and they can send it to someone across the country or someone far away. 
and they can help that person. They can heal them or they can contact them or a psychic can see something going on somewhere else. And you've got all the remote viewers out there. And we've done podcasts on the remote viewers about being able to see things far away. So I don't know if we totally understand how this energy works. And by that point, why couldn't someone like the witch per se, instead of putting out positive healing energy, she puts out negative debilitating energy to harm this man? It's possible. Is it probable? I don't know. But we're still learning so much about our world and the different dimensions and how everything works and the way energy works that, I don't know. I, I, I just really don't know. But folks, I'll know this. Our contact info is in the show notes. And if you have a thought or comment on this, just let us know. So until next time, when we discuss another tale yet to be told. Thank you for listening. And remember to like and share the show. We would also appreciate a five-star rating wherever possible to help new listeners find the show. We welcome all questions or comments you may have about this or any other episode, and our contact information can be found in the show notes of this episode. You can also follow us at foreverparanormal.com, and if you'd like to support us, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash foreverparanormal. The links to these are also in the show notes of this episode.